Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the Find Me in the Secret Place podcast with your favorite sister in Christ, Aaliyah Renee. And if I'm not your favorite sister in Christ, that's all right. Do you want to have a little self-care moment, a self-care night? Um, We can like make masks like avocado masks or how about the Aztec clay masks? Do people still use those? Because those were really popular when I was like in high school. I don't know how old. I don't know. Am I that old? Was it in high school? Mm, It was probably like early university for me. That's when it was really popping off. But yeah, we can have a little self-care night. We could cut cucumbers and like read the word and stuff and listen to that like nice, very zen um, instrumental worship instead of the frequencies. We can do that and we can pray. Y'all, how are you? How are you doing? The world is crazy. Um, there has been such a big burden on my heart for so many things and just know that I have each and every one of you in mind and in prayer. Of course, I don't know and understand your every struggle, but I really appreciate the comments because those help me kind of have like directed prayers and, um, yeah, thank you for always just being so supportive and also praying for me. This week has been so interesting. It's been a week of testimonies, but also been a week of like, Lord, what the heck is going on? Like what, what's going on? Um, which I will share briefly because, you know, this is family, but we'll do that. We'll do that in a second. I want to just kind of set the tone in the atmosphere and welcome you all to the Find Me in the Secret Place podcast. If it's your first time here, hey, welcome to the Secret Place. I'm so happy to have you. My name is Aaliyah Renee and I am just a vessel for the Lord. And I'm so honored to be the host of this podcast. We have so much fun. We are family here and it's so great to be here. The Secret Place is really a place for vulnerability, transformation, and most importantly, communion with God. You don't come here to hear me speak. You come here to hear God speak through me. And if that can be done and it be done for his glory, that's that's always such an amazing privilege and an honor to me. Today, I'm wearing all black because it's a funeral. We are having a funeral to our flesh. It is time for us to address the flesh and make today, whenever you're listening to this, the day that you dedicate yourself to the Lord, whether rededicate or dedicate yourself for the first time to the Lord and really say that you're going to kill the flesh and walk in the spirit. The Bible talks at length about dying to self, dying to your flesh, surrendering your flesh. The spirit is willing. The flesh is weak. We're going to talk about this buzzword of the flesh. We're going to divine define it. We're going to explore it. We're going to see how in the world we even came to deal with this battle of sin and spirit um, when we are inducted into the covenant of salvation through the blood of Jesus Christ. When we accept him as our Lord and Savior, we receive the Holy Spirit, but we still dwell on earth in bodies of flesh. And the Bible talks a lot about the flesh, and I believe that it's intentional. And the Bible tells us in Hosea, I believe it's Hosea 4 or 5. No, I believe it's Isaiah 4 or 6. It's an even number that says that God's people perish because of a lack of knowledge. And many times we'll say these words, but we don't educate ourselves on these things. And I want to be the first to apologize if I've ever said the word flesh or put it in my title and never truly expounded on it. I believe that I've talked about it a little bit, but we're going to talk about it at length today. So I'm going to warn you, this might be a little bit of a longer podcast episode. We've been trying to hover at the 30 minute mark, but listen, you know that could only last so long. We'll be back to the shorter podcast episodes, hopefully soon if the Lord wills. But I have a lot of scripture for you today. It's really just a fun, this is what I love to do. Okay. This is to me, this is what I love. I don't really like, like, preaching my own stuff. I really just love reading the Bible and seeing where the Lord takes us. And he's been preparing this word, um, in me for a couple of weeks. I don't even think, do I have a date stamp? It's definitely before October. I don't have a date stamp for you, but it's looking like it's almost been a month. This has been cooking up and I'm so excited to share this with you. So let's first start by charging and setting the atmosphere and we're going to pray You might want to pause this and grab some water, grab a snack, grab your notebook. We're going to have so much fun in the word of the Lord. And I just can't wait to share with you what he has been talking to me about. This has been so much fun. And hopefully this inspires you to continue digging deeper into your word because you can do this too. You can have Bible time with the Lord just like this because I'm just reading the word. This is really him. So when I get on here, I'll be chilling. I used to be real scared sitting up on here with the heaviness in my chest. But that's when I it was like, oh, Leah, you need to do something. 
when I just let the words speak, I be coming out here just excited. Like I'm just gonna read. I'm just gonna read it. That's all I'm gonna do. So yes, let's get started. First and foremost with prayer. So if you're able to, please bow your heads and close your eyes with me. And if not, just focus on Jesus, okay? Okay. Hi, Jesus. Hi, Lord. I love you. Hey, Holy Spirit. What is up? Um, I'm so happy to be here, Lord. I'm just so happy to be able to dwell in your presence and also dwell with my brothers and sisters in Christ here in the Find Me in the Secret Place podcast. Lord Jesus, I just want your Holy Spirit to be here. He's already here. He lives within me. You're, he's been with me all day, all week. He's been helping me. And you have been literally hammering in this message for myself before I even got to sit down on this couch for this podcast. And it is really such a treat, Lord, that you allow us to dive into your word. I just feel like I'm on an island with just me and you, God. It's just us. And it's so, it's so awesome to be able to just like dwell in the secret place, hidden in your presence, O Lord God of the Almighty, O Lord Jesus. We want to have knowledge from your word today. Me, I just want to sit here and be able to learn something new. Lord Jesus, we ask for a revelation from your word that only you can give. Oh, Lord God, I ask that as your vessel that you would clear my mind, clear my heart, clear my body, that you would make it less of me and more of you, oh Lord Jesus, that you would be able to speak. Your word says that if you be lifted up, you'll draw all men unto you. And I ask that you would just draw our hearts unto you today, that we would remove distractions, we would remove cloudy or foggy minds. And we will be ready to receive your word, O oh Lord God, a word that may bring us conviction and rebuke, but that will also encourage us to walk in the spirit of the Holy Spirit that you've given us, O oh Lord God. O oh Lord Jesus, it is your desire for us to walk in the full promise and inheritance that you've given us and sin blocks us, O oh Lord Jesus. So it is our desire to learn more about how we can have a funeral to the flesh so we can live life more abundantly in the righteousness and in the life that you have given us. Lord Jesus, let us be good ground, not hard ground. Open our ears and make our hearts of stone into hearts of flesh. We are but a pottery. We are but clay in the potter's hand. So mold us into the way that you wish us to break us and and and, and bind us into the, the structures and the disciples that you wish for us to have. Let us have humility and meekness and an openness and an eagerness and an obedience like a child to their father in this presence, O Lord God, in the presence of our Lord. And I'm just so grateful for you, God. You're so awesome. You, 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 you just get me and I love you. I pray all these things in Jesus name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Oh my goodness. Okay. So quick, 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 small baby, little tiny announcement is people are using my podcast. (laughs) People are using my podcast for an ad. Okay. I've gotten a couple messages as of this October, 2024, couple messages from some concerned brothers and sisters. And I really want to thank you for your vigilance and sending them, sending me screenshots and videos. I reached out to YouTube. There's really not much we can do. The only thing that we can do is one, pray, pray that the Lord takes us down and whatever deceptive thing that they're trying to do with my video. They literally took my video, put AI on it, have some like really weird derogatory things that I would not say on that video, which is concerning, but I, I'm so grateful for you all. And I'm grateful that you are filled with the spirit of discernment and you are filled with such a compassion and a love for your sister that you sent it to me. And yeah, I reached out to YouTube. There's not much we can do, but when you see the ad, just please make sure to report it. Um, there should be a way to report it either like some three dots. Um, or if you click like a down arrow, just quickly report it. And that is what we can do to really fix the issue. And just thank you for your prayers. Um, Um, honestly, I was talking to some of you all and even just talking to my mom and it's really just the light of Christ. And just like what we'll learn about here in the scripture, the devil will take something that is pure that God has created and he'll twist it. And I'm just grateful that it's reaching people because the the person who did that, they had to watch my video and be like, hmm, I'm going to use this video. Then they had to download it and edit it. So the word was just regurgitating in them. Okay. And that was a good one. That was talking about Jesus being the only thing we need. So I pray that the video get taken down, but I also pray that the people who had to edit that video be convicted by the Holy Spirit, right? Have a gentle conviction from the Holy Spirit, maybe a little rougher one. Um, and hopefully draw them closer to God and, and, cause them to walk in in rightness with Jesus. That's all I could ask for. Um, 
but yeah i just want to let you know because i have been getting a lot of messages from it but yeah i i honestly i just pray that god get glory from it if if the person who did this and is trying to scam people get saved and feel conviction maybe you're a subscriber listen i appreciate you i love you but we gotta stop it baby please take it out so yeah if you see it please report it and i thank you for everyone for letting me know now let's get into the word i'm so excited okay like I said, pen and paper, let's get started. This is going to be a good one. It's going to be a long one. God is going to speak. I'm telling you. All right, let's go to Romans chapter five. All right, this is, this is our start. Okay. So in order to put to death our flesh, right? We hear this dying to self. We need an introduction to what sin is, and we need to understand how sin entered the equation, but we also need to understand what, when was the awakening of our flesh? Okay, so we're going to go to Romans chapter five. And in Romans chapter five, verse 12, it says this. Okay, it says, therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin. And in this way, death came to all people because all sin. Okay, going down to uh, verse 18 and 19 of the same chapter, it says, consequently, just as one trespass, one sin resulted in condemnation for all people, so also one righteous act resulted in justification and life for all people. For just as through the disobedience of one man, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man, the many will be made righteous. All right, so we're seeing this framework here that is alluding to our great, 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 grandfather, Adam, and our greatest of greats, grandmother, Eve. All right, we know the story of how we as humans were created perfect by God in the beginning of time, in the beginning of the world, but we exercise free will because God has given us free will And what we chose to do with this free will is actually to disobey God. And because of this, we fell into sin. And this is what Romans 5 is alluding to. You can read about the creation story from Genesis 1, but more specifically the fall of man in Genesis 3, where we see that Eve first eats of this fruit that is forbidden of her to eat from the Lord because she's tempted by the serpent, this serpent being Satan. And because of this, she then gives it to her husband, Adam, and they both fall into sin. But what's unique is they gain this knowledge of good and evil. And because of this, we're introduced to our sinful nature. In Genesis chapter three, verse 22, God speaks of this man and this woman after they eat of this fruit that was forbidden. And God says they become like us. They now know good and evil. And what we see is not only does God curse men and women because of their disobedience, where man will have to toil the ground, women, you already know what's up, you know what I'm saying? We get the period cramps, we gotta like, mm, let me not even talk about it, but just know we, we have a lot of pain. That was the curse. But we're also, by consequence, introduced to our sinful nature. This is what God means when he says in Genesis 3, verse 22, now he knows good and evil. At first, man only knew good, right? He knew the good of the God that created him. God spent much time with man in the garden. He oversaw man and gave him such dominion that he allowed him to have free will enough to not only just choose like each and every one of his wills, but the free will to exercise the dominion that he had over the earth to name every single one of the animals. But unfortunately, what man chooses to do with this free will that God gives him before the foundations of history is he chooses to sin. He chooses to exercise his free will to gain knowledge of good and evil. So not only does he now understand this knowledge of good, being the things of God, being what he, since the beginning of his formation from dust understood, he now has the knowledge of evil. And this now awakens and introduces our sinful nature. So here we see in Romans five, it's recapping what happened in the garden in a very beautiful way. Um, and in a very concise way, it says, in verse 12, therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, through the decision of one man and woman, sin entered the world and then entered the lineage of man. So not only were Adam and Eve affected by the sin, but this was an curse that was brought on to the rest of their generations. So we see that not only are Adam and Eve entering into sin, but the rest of their offspring are born into sin. 
And this is just amplified when we see Cain and Abel, um, where the jealous brother Cain kills his brother Abel because God accepts Abel's sacrifice over Cain's, right? So this was just, again, evidence of the consequences of the decision that Adam and Eve made in the garden. These consequences leading to sin being embedded in to each and every single human that was born. And not only was this for Adam and Eve, but for Cain and Abel and their generations and generations and generations. We see this in the time of Noah, where all of the earth was widespread with evil, where they were even having sex with an intercourse with angels and creating these demonic, half human, half divine beings, these Nephilim that were living on the earth. And God was literally like, look at the wickedness that was created in this world that all started because of Adam and Eve. And even after the flood, because, because we are born into sinful nature, even though majority of the population was wiped, wiped, and it was just Noah's family left, each and every one of them still had this seed of sinful nature that started at the fall. And this is where we actually get to see now because of what happens in the garden in Genesis chapter three, where we awaken this flesh, this carnality, the battle now begins between our good, this godly nature that we are born into and this evil, this evil carnality is, that has now been introduced and amplified by our depravity. And what I mean by that is that not only did this act of sin in the garden lead to us knowing good and evil and then awakening this evil desire in us, right? Because we now are walking in our flesh more than we're walking with God because we've chosen disobedience as mankind. But what this also, this event also does is cause the greatest depravity that man will ever experience and something that will sh be shifted until Jesus comes and reconciles this depravity with his death. See, what happens when Adam and Eve are sin is that they're kicked out of the garden. And because they're kicked out of the garden, they're now away from the presence of the God who gave them everything, provided for them, wanted to give them all of these good things. But because they exercise their free will, God has to punish them because he is a just God. He's a loving, but also just God. He takes them out of the garden and now they are in a place of depravity. Not only does Adam have to toil the ground, not only does does that provide depravity? But Eve now has depravity in that her pain that she has to go through to bear children. But also there's depravity that supersedes all of this because they're deprived from this presence of God that is literally the, the, the lifeblood of man. Like we are created to commune with the Lord, to worship him. And now because of sin, we're separated from that, which creates this hunger in man that can only be fulfilled by God, but our minds are tainted by our sin. So we look for it in other places. And that in and of itself is this battle that we deal with. And what's beautiful is thousands of years later, because God has such mercy and such grace for his, the, the, the mankind that he's created, he sees that we've suffered. He sends us prophets to try and tell us to repent and still, and yet and still our depravity and our sinful nature, our flesh begins to win. He sends Jesus. And through Jesus's death and resurrection, he frees us from sin and Jesus gives us the Holy Spirit, right? Jesus gives us this Holy Spirit. And we actually see this being spoken about in the same chapter of Romans. If you go to Romans chapter five, verse eight, which is a little bit above where we were reading, it said, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more having being reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? So through death, we're reconciled to God. He pays the price for us. He pays this price that, that has started since the beginning of the garden and he reconciles us back to life. And what's beautiful is, after this, not only do we just get eternal life, but Jesus is like, hey, listen, it's going to be real ghetto on this earth. So I'm going to give you a companion, a helper, an advocate to stay with you and dwell with you. So before Jesus leaves, he says, I'm going to give you a peace that the world can't even give you. I'm going to give you the spirit of God, the Ruach HaKodesh in your, in your literal being. I'm going to give you God in spirit form inside of you, which is the Holy Spirit, right? So he frees us from sin. We're given the Holy Spirit. We see this in Romans 5 verse 8, but the catch is we're still living in fleshly bodies. So this is that sneak peek that Jesus gives us in Mark 14, where he sees the disciples struggling with trying to, you know, stay up with him and pray with him in the garden of Gethsemane during these last final moments, but they're falling asleep. 
Jesus tells us this. He says, your spirit is willing. This spirit that is driven by the Holy Spirit, that has a desire to the, to obey God is willing. It wants to do good, but the flesh is weak. And this is really that New Testament introduction to flesh, right? This duality of man that we deal with where each day that we walk on earth, we have this this conflict in our bodies just by nature because Adam sins. So he's awakened our flesh, but Jesus saves and he's awakened our spirit. So we have the flesh telling us that it wants to sin. It wants to disobey God and our spirit that wants to live and do the things of the Lord. And both of these are working actively in opposition of each other. And there's other scriptures that actually feed into this and build this up. So the next logical question that you might be asking yourself is what is flesh? What is this thing that Jesus tells us is so weak in Matthew 14? He says, your spirit is willing. You want to do the things of God, but your flesh is weak. What is flesh? Now flesh, the Greek word for flesh is sarx. This literally means your body, right? This encasing that we live in, but it also means our earthly nature outside of God's divine influence. This is the root word for a greater word called sarkikos. Sarkikos means carnality, and this is having the nature of our flesh. More specifically, this means when we as humans are governed more by our human nature and not by the spirit of God. These literally relate to these animalistic appetites that we have as humans that we sometimes choose to obey over the obedience of God. And this is exactly what we're seeing Um, that, that Jesus is introducing to his disciples in Mark 14, where he says, your spirit is willing, but your flesh, this part of you that is governed by your human nature and not by the things of God, these animalistic appetites that you have to fall asleep rather than to pray, those things are weak, but your spirit is willing. And in the same way we have to battle. And I want to expand on this idea of carnality, this word sarkikos in the Greek, um, Sarkikos is this carnality, right? We're born into this state due to the fall that we talked about in Genesis 3, verse 22, right? Where Jesus, where God says, okay, now they have a knowledge of good and evil. They've wakened up, they've awakened this carnality, this, 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 this fleshly desire. They've awakened it. They've done the thing that I wanted to prevent it. They've awakened this fleshly desire simply because of sin. So this is Sarkikos. And this carnality drives this feeling of human depravity. And depravity is simply being desperate with desire for something, right? For many of us, we can identify things that maybe you desire. Maybe you feel like you have a depravity for. Maybe this is something that you long for that you've never been able to fulfill. For some of us, it can be love. It can be attention. It can be compassion. It could be fulfillment, purpose. It could be power or control. All of these are things that are driven by our carnality and we have a depravity. We have a need for these things. And this human depravity creates desire. It creates something like our animal appetites, which is literally the definition of flesh. It is your animalistic appetite. And because of this, we want for the things that we are deprived of. And in that depravity and in these animalistic appetites, we have a choice. We can either choose to obey these animalistic appetites or surrender them to the Lord and look to him. And here's the thing, using language like the animalistic, like your flesh, the sin that you're born into, if you follow that, you're essentially like an animal following its desires. And this is a heavy hitter, at least for me, because when we're living in sin, when we're doing and gratifying our flesh, we're literally living like animals. We're being compared to animals. When Jesus says that your flesh is weak, it's literally saying the thing that will literally make you like an animal is weak. And that is what's driving you. And if you think about an animal that is lacking something, they're only driven by the absence of their need. So if an animal wants to do something, if it's not trained, it's going to do it. And in the same way, if we follow these fleshly desires, we're just like animals. Let's break it down real quick, okay? If you have an untrained puppy, right? If it wants to use the bathroom, is it gonna just wait? Is it gonna just sit there and wait for you or be like, hey, I need to go to the bathroom or like do a little barky dance to communicate it to you or press on those little fancy buttons I see on TikTok? No. If a wild dog, an untrained dog, or a newborn puppy wants to use a bathroom, it's going to use a bathroom. If it wants to poop, it's going to poop anywhere. With disregard for any of the value, it's going to poop on the couch. If it wants to, it doesn't care if the couch costs money. It doesn't care if your computer costs money. It's going to pee wherever it wants to pee and poop wherever it wants to poop. Because it's literally an animal following its desire. 
In the same way, if an animal is sexually harassed, it will hump anything. It'll hump your chair. It'll hump your leg. It'll hump its other dog, brother, or sister. It will hump inanimate objects and trees. It will do all of that simply because it's an animal following its animalistic appetite. If an animal is hungry, it will eat practically anything, things that are poisonous for it. It will eat its own feces sometimes. And even some species of animals, if they're that hungry, they will actually eat their kids. They'll eat their young. So when we're compared, when we're actually looking at the fundamentals of what it means to live in your flesh, what it means to, for the word flesh to actually be active and for you to just live in sin with disregard for God, you're living like an animal doing whatever you want. The same way that you'll look at your dog and be like, oh, how can you just eat that? You'll, you'll literally eat anything. You'll eat your own throw up or you'll just poo anywhere. You'll, you'll just hump random things. Like, do you have no dignity? In the same way God looks at us when we act in our own depravity, when we act in, on our own flesh, which literally means our animalistic desires outside of the will of God. He looks at us and says, is this what you're going to do? Because you want love, you're going to turn to sex and do whatever you want. Because you want power right away, you're going to murder, you're going to steal, you're going to cheat, you're going to be envious. In the same way, because you want control, you're going to abuse people and manipulate and mistreat others. That's how God looks at us when we are moving on our own animalistic desires. Just because you're not going around eating your own poopy doesn't mean that some of the things that you do when you act in your flesh isn't disgusting. Let's keep it real. So in the same way where you'll look at an untrained dog and be like, how can you eat that? Or like, look at a cat eating its own vomit and be like, oh, that's disgusting. Or like, look at a squirrel eating literally chewed up food or like just pooping anywhere or like eating its own poop or like bunnies eat their own poop. And you're like, oh, that's gross. Some of the things that we do driven by flesh is disgusting. And if you take a second and just think about it without the the lens of pride, you're like, hold up. No, that is terrible. So going back to our cycle, we are born into sarkikos. We're born into carnality, which then drives human depravity because we desire for these things that only God can fulfill. But because we've been separated since the garden, we have to accept the inheritance of Jesus Christ to rectify that. And then even when we're saved, we have to actively wake up each day and say, Lord, whenever depravity arises, I'm going to choose you. Because if we don't, that is going to create animalistic appetites that is going to lead to sinful nature's desires and also lead us to sin and that sin is simply just going to amplify and gratify and validate the flesh that we were lived into the sarkikos so it goes sarkikos we're born into carnality which creates this human depravity which then leads to animalistic appetites which then causes us to sin and then that sin just amplifies the sarkikos it amplifies our carnality and it just keeps going around and around and around and around and around and around and around so the answer is How do you stop your animals from doing gross, nasty things? You train them. And this is what's beautiful about Romans 12 verse two, where we can't conform to the world, but we need to renew our minds. There's a training that needs to come in and it's not just like, oh, I'm saved now. Now I'm good. I'm going to heaven. But how do you want to conduct yourself for the rest of your life before you meet Christ? Because we're all going to have to give an account for the actions that we have. And if we're just okay with like being mediocre Christians that also are just being like driven by our flesh and asking like animals and being like, well, I accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior, so who cares? That's an abuse of grace. And we read so many times in Romans and Corinthians that says, just because you have grace, does that mean you should keep sinning? Paul's like, absolutely not. Paul being the writer of those books says, absolutely not. Why would we abuse the grace of God when he has been so merciful to us to extend it to us in the first place? So much so that he becomes man, lives 33 years, dies one of the most, if not the most excruciatingly, painfully disgusting deaths. Like scientifically, people's heads would like explode out of the much, uh, the amount of pain that he experienced. And we're just going to be like, okay, like, yeah, yeah, Jesus died for me. Like, I'm good, whatever. Like, I'm just going to keep sinning. And you keep asking for forgiveness and forgiveness and forgiveness and forgiveness, but you do the same thing. Repentance literally is a term that was used in the Roman Empire for armies. Repentance means to turn. It means to do a 180, not a 360. Because some of us be spinning around. We think and we're doing so much, but you end up back in the same place of sin. It literally means a 180, which is what we're going to talk about and these practical steps, because I know it's so easy for us to say, I'm going to kill my flesh, but we need to identify what it is, which is what we're doing now. We're building this case to say that, honestly, if you deal with these things, it doesn't mean that you're a bad Christian. 
everyone deals with sin. Everyone deals with the desire and animalistic desire of their flesh because you're living in the flesh. As long as you're alive on earth, you're going to have this, have this battle between the spirit that's willing and the flesh that's weak. And it really is your decision to choose what you want to do. So let's go back now. We're going to go back, go back. And we're going to look at the consequences now of carnality. We're going to go to Romans chapter eight, and we're going to start at verse six. This speaks on, actually, we're going to start at verse five. This speaks on the consequences of our carnality. So what happens when you just let it run free? Let's say you're, you're listening to me you're like, you know what? I'm just going to keep filling my, my depravity of love by having sex with multiple partners and just doing whatever I want. I don't really care. I'm not going to listen to God. I'm going to use, I'm going to have this depravity of control and I'm going to fulfill that by manipulating others and lying to them and cheating and stealing and being envious and never being satisfied. I'm okay. I'm going to do that. And I'm going to be a Christian too. It is what it is. All right. So let's go to Romans chapter eight. Let me tell you why you can't do that. Okay. Real quick. Buki. Romans chapter eight, verse five. It says, those who live according to the flesh, we've defined it. We know what this is. These animalistic desires. I've given examples. You know this. You have it in your notes. Go back if you need to. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the spirit have their minds set on what the spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death. But the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. That's period point blank. That's why we should want to transform ourselves. This is why we should want to change. This is why we should wear all black today and we should let it go. We should have a funeral to the flesh because at the end of the day, verse eight, those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. So you can fool yourself into thinking that living as a Christian, but also dabbling into the things of your flesh and living in sin and being like lukewarm, wishy-washy and abusing grace. Yeah, you can, you can fool yourself into thinking that that's acceptable to the Lord, but it's very clear. Romans eight, verse eight, you will never be able to please God. If you're in the realm of the flesh, if you're doing the things that your flesh wants you to do, you will never be able to please God. So you may be asking yourself now, okay, uh, Aaliyah, but what exactly are these things that the flesh wants to do. And that's a great question because the Bible writes it out so clear for you. God gives you the blueprint of what exactly is going on. So let's go to Galatians 5. We love Galatians. Galatians is so beautiful. Galatians 5. Oh my gosh, fruits of the spirit. Fruits of, I love the fruits of the spirit, Leah. I know them all. I can recite all nine of them. Okay, that's beautiful. But let's let's read the fruits of the flesh. This is going to be like us holding up a mirror as it says in James. We're going to hold up the mirror. We're going to examine ourselves with the word. I love what it says in first Timothy, where it says that the, I believe it's first Timothy, where it says that the Bible is used not only for teaching, but for correction, rebuke. Okay. So now we're, we're going to let the Bible read us. So we remember what it says here in Romans eight. I'm just going to remind us really quickly what it says in Romans eight. And then we're going to jump. We're going to jump over here. So in Romans eight, it says those who live according to the flesh have their mindset on what the flesh desires. But those who live according to the spirit have their mindset on what the spirit desires. So let's take a look and see what are the things that the flesh desires. Okay, this is perfect. The Bible is amazing. Wow. The, what, this is what the flesh desires. Okay, let's start at verse 16. It says, so I say, walk by the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Okay, wait, Romans chapter 8 was just, do you see how beautiful the Bible is? Romans chapter 8 was just saying we shouldn't do what the flesh desires. And now we see here that we're being reintroduced now to the desires of the flesh for the flesh, for the flesh desires, what is contrary to the spirit and the spirit, what is contrary to the flesh, going back to what we talked about, having this carnal nature where Jesus tells us in Mark 14, that your spirit is willing, but the flesh is ultimately weak. They each want two different things. And it, and it, this is the reality of living as a Christian on earth. You're going to be battling with the desires of one thing that is completely contrary to the other, but it's your responsibility as a Christian to choose the right thing, to choose the good thing, to choose the things that the spirit desires. All right. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other so that you are not so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. All right. So here we go. The acts of the flesh, the desires of the flesh are such 
Let me grab it from the uh, New King James Version. All right. And we're actually going to go through and define each and every one. I'm not just going to run through one by one and like not tell you what they are. I'm actually going to run through each and every one. Okay. Again, I told you this is word and this is all Bible. So all I did was I took this. I've been using Logos. Okay. Logos is fire. I'm so excited to share with you all the great things that are happening with Logos in a little bit, but it's been great. And they're doing a relaunch. And I'm so excited to share that with you. But anyways, I've been using Logos. They have so many resources, including the Strong's Concordance, which is essentially going to break down the Hebrew meaning, in this case, the Greek meaning, right? Because the New Testament, Testament was written and majorly, majorly distributed in Greek for the Gentiles to understand, we're going to see what each of these words mean. Okay. So verse 19, this is now in the new King James version. Now the works of the flesh, the desires of the flesh, the wants of the flesh, the desires of the flesh are evident. They're very clear. This is what they are, which are adultery. What is adultery? This can be sex outside of your marital partner, like things like cheating, cheating on your boyfriend, cheating on your girlfriend, cheating on your spouse. That's idolatry. But if you go to Matthew 5 verse 28, Jesus tells us that even if you look at a man or woman with the intent of like, dang, I want to really smash, that's adultery. So that is a fruit of the flesh. Let's keep going. Adultery. Already got me. You know what I'm saying? Already got me. Number two, fornication. What is fornication? Fornication is sex outside of holy matrimony ordained between a male and a female between God. Okay? In the in the context of holy matrimony. So if you're having sex outside of that context, you are sinning. That is fornication. And you know what's crazy? Foreplay counts too. Okay? So just because you're not entering doesn't mean if you were around it and if you're doing something sexual outside of the context of holy matrimony ordained by God, male and female, you're sinning. That's fornication. Okay. Number two, what's next? Uncleanliness. What is uncleanliness? This is not just a body thing. This is actually unpure motives and unclean morality. This is having a lack of purity and hear this, an unclean heart. What is your heart posture? She's like, oh girl, I'm not having sex, but those people nasty. You're practicing uncleanliness because that's an unclean heart. Who are you to judge? That is an unclean heart that you have towards other people. So in and of itself, because just because you think you're not sinning in a very overt way and doing all these things does not give you the right to judge others because as you judge, you enter into uncleanliness in your heart. You have an unclean heart towards others. The next one is lewdness. What is lewdness? This is tied with lust. This is having this outward displaying of yourself in a sexual way. I want you to think of thirst traps. I want you to think of having a lack of modesty, especially when you conduct yourself outside or conduct yourself on social media. And a lot of people, they want to just pin the girls for this because, oh, the girls, they wear short shorts and they have low cleavage tops. Men, you have boobies too. You got pectorals too. So just because it's societally... Okay, it's it's wrong for a woman to have like a certain type of clothing. Doesn't mean that we want to see your your boobies and your titties out on, on Instagram. Excuse my French, but we don't want to see that either. And that's still practicing lewdness. That's still going to cause potentially a brother or sister in Christ to stumble on either side. Same for a woman. So let's not just hold women accountable, but men, let's hold ourselves accountable as well. Let's hold yourselves accountable as well because you also have a conduct. Men are not the only one that look at things and are like, they get aroused and they get sexually tempted. And I think that's a big disservice to our women and our female sisters in Christ, where we just think they're immune to dealing with sexual sin and sexual immorality and lust and fornication when we're some of the most silent sufferers. And that's a part of my testimony. So in the same way, men, you have a responsibility to hold your conduct in modesty You at the gym, we don't need to see all the sweat droplets dripping down every single uh, six-piece ab. Keep that for your your wife. We don't need to see that. Women are not immune to these things. Women experience the same amount of sexual temptation as, as men do. And I think it's unfair if we pretend that that's not true. Anyway, sorry for another day. Next, idolatry. What is idolatry? Not just worshiping. Oh, I'm I'm not worshiping Buddha. I'm not worshiping Allah. I'm not worshiping a God that that isn't God. I love Jesus. I gave my life to Christ. But are you putting things above the Lord? Idolatry is literally anything that you put before God, anything that you love more than God, anything that your attention, that your obedience goes toward more than having obedience, attention, and love and affection to the Lord your phones, not prioritizing God, your jobs, your relationships, your fixation on things that are not in his will. That is all idolatry. Things that you choose 
and consistently choose more than God is an idol in your life. Next, sorcery. This can be any type of witchcraft, crystals, readings, horoscopes, tarot cards, forms of manifestation outside of the will of God. And what's crazy is 1 Samuel chapter 15 tells us that even disobedience to God is considered witchcraft. Obedience is better than any sacrifice that you can give to the Lord, having obedience to him. And wickedness and, and witchcraft is equivalent to disobedience. When, when Saul disobeys God, it is equivalent to witchcraft. So when we hear sorcery, we think not, we just think about, oh, I don't do the crystals, but you disobey God sometimes. That's a fruit of the flesh. That is disobedience. That is equivalent to witchcraft. First Samuel 15. Next, after sorcery, we have hatred. This is a dislike of others to have contempt or even unforgiveness in your heart. Next is contention. These are heated disagreements. The other is jealousies. Having discontentment or unhappiness or feeling unfulfilled in your own life and with your own things. So you want the things of others. Next, outbursts of wrath. This is anger. This is swearing at others, gossiping, yelling, fighting, and having strife towards others. This is a fruit of the flesh. Selfish ambition. This is putting yourself before God, as well as putting your goals before his will for you. Now, no, it's a selfish ambition. Ambition in and of itself is not bad. It is good for us to have ambition, to have goals, and to want to thrive and make good differences in the world. But when it is contrary to the purpose that God has for you, and you're persistently following your own desires over the desires that God God has for you that becomes selfish. So if God has placed you in somewhere, somewhere and you have ambitions, you want to do well, that's amazing. But when you're walking contrary to the Lord and you're ambitious in, in pursuing things that God has not ordained for you or things that go contrary to his word, that's selfish ambition. And that's a fruit of the flesh. Boom. Let's keep going. We're going to jump a little bit. We're going to jump a little bit. All right, right here. Let's keep going. So we just did, what did we just do? We did selfishness. The next thing we have is dissensions. What are dissensions? These are fights amongst others, specifically in the same belief as you. So we're talking about things that stem from church hurt. Church hurt stems from us exercising our flesh more than we exercise the spirit because dissensions is essentially speaking about disagreements with those who are close to you and believe the same things as you. Christian versus Christian, which leads to church hurt heresies. These are holding beliefs contrary to the word of God. Envy, very similar to jealousy, to have a burning desire for what someone else has. Murders. This goes beyond just physical death. As Jesus tells us in Matthew 5, that anger with your brother that is unjustified is equivalent to murder. So if you have anger towards your brother or sister in Christ, or even just brothers and sisters that you walk with on earth, this is equivalent to murder in the eyes of God. Jesus says this in Matthew 5. I believe it's like around verse 20 or 21. Drunkenness. This is drinking until you're gonzo. Okay. So this is not just talking about, cause I know there's this big debate and I'm not going to get into it. What he's talking about is drunkenness. This is drinking until you are gone and you are uncontrollably walking around, stumbling around in your body. Why does God care? Because some of us are like, why does God care if I get drunk on a Saturday? Da, da, da. God cares because not only are you putting yourself in danger, but at that point, you're not thinking straight. You're putting yourself in danger and you're also distancing yourself from the Holy Spirit and his influence. Hear me. If you're under the influence of alcohol, you are out of the influence of the Holy Spirit. And that's why it's so important for us to stay sober minded. So we're tapped into the influence of the Lord. I'm not just talking about alcohol. We got to surrender the weed too. I'm sorry, y'all. We got to surrender the weed too. Anything that takes you out of your right mind, you're practicing, you're, you're, you're practicing a fruit of the flesh. It's hard, especially if you have addictions because then you're like, Lord, how am I supposed to do this? But he gives an answer to this. If we walk in the spirit, trust me, we're going to get there. Next is revelries. These are wild, noisy parties. So this again, in our wild, noisy parties, and the definition goes further to say these involve large amounts of drinking. Okay. Going back to drunkenness. Okay. So all of these from verse 19 to 21 are what God is telling us. These are the fruits of the flesh. So we talk about carnality. We talk about these animalistic appetites. When we follow those, we may find ourselves in these, I believe there's 19 or 15, 16 different one of these. When we're walking outside of the step of the spirit, these are these desires that were, that are spoken about in Romans eight, where it says that when you're following the desires of the flesh, that's what they're talking about, all of these things. But then what's beautiful 
is that there's another side to it that we've been alluding to, that we've been talking about. Jesus saves us and he saves us in such a beautiful way that he gives us the Holy Spirit. And because of that, when we walk in the spirit, we exhibit his fruits. So going back to this, it says those who live according to the flesh have their mindset on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the spirit have their mind set on what the spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death. And that makes sense. Think of all 15, 16 of those things that we just talked about. All of those things would lead to death. If you have hatred and you're you're just fighting people, you're having revelries. If you get drunk, you can get alcohol poisoning. You can drink yourself to death. You can smoke yourself to death. You can be addicted to things that lead to your death. You can be angry with someone and that can lead to your death. You can fight the wrong person. You could yell and swear at the wrong person. If you're vile, if you don't have peace in your heart, that can lead to death. And in the same way, God is warning us like a good father. He's saying, if you want to live life more abundantly, you need to say goodbye to the things of the flesh because you know that this is bad. You know that what you're doing does not actually benefit you in any way. And if you really think about it in the fact of animalistic desires, I remember when I was addicted to watching sexual videos on the internet whenever, whenever, following my desires, doing the things that I wanted to do. It was like I was an animal where I just desired like, okay, now I'm, now I'm aroused. So I need to go do something. I didn't have any self-control. I would just do whatever I wanted, whenever I wanted to do it. If I wanted to drink, I would drink and I would have no restraint. And then I would do whatever I want. And then the next morning I'm like, oh my gosh, I did that. Oh my gosh, this is how I acted and conducted myself. That's not even me. So when we look at these things, let's look at it and be realistic right? Because these things are harmful. We want this, this worldly freedom that's a lie because it's not freedom. You're a slave to your sin. That goes, it goes on to say that for the rest of the verse. It says that in, in the rest of, of the scripture, I believe it's either Romans. I think it is Romans eight. Um, that tells us that you're a slave to these things. You think you're free. You're not free. You're a slave to your addictions. You're a slave to what people think about you. You're a slave to your flesh. Continuing on, it says here, the good things, right? But the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Let's go through each and every one of these and we'll wrap up the episode there. What does love mean? Love is to have goodwill towards others and to have brotherly love. That already beats about half of the fruits of the flesh. That beats dissensions and fighting against others. That beats murdering. That beats having like strife towards others. That beats all of that. That beats having hatred or being unclean because when you have love, you treat yourself and others with respect. Joy is to have gladness. And when you have gladness, you are content. You're content in your situation. That, so that gets rid of jealousy and that gets rid of envy. Peace, this tranquility will remove things like contentions and like just wanting to fight each other or even having murderous intentions. Patience, this endurance and perseverance is going to allow you to withstand certain temptations and things that may have brought you into sin kindness, moral goodness. That's moral goodness and our integrity. This is going to beat hatred. This is going to beat envy and dissensions and even selfish ambition. Because when you have kindness towards other, you think about others before yourself. Goodness relates to this. This is about being upright in your heart and your life and to live like Jesus, someone who is filled with love and filled with good conduct with others. There's no room if you have life with goodness and you live like Jesus for you to walk in these things of the flesh. Then there's faith. This is the faith that without faith, it's impossible to please God. This is amazing. This is not only your belief in God and Christ, but to also be someone that can be relied upon, to have a faithful conduct, to have a faithful character and the fruit of faith, that fruit of the spirit, that is faithfulness. Others can rely on you in such a beautiful way. And you can see how that already combats with other things. Gentleness is to be humble, to be gentle, to be quiet. As it says in 1 Thessalonians 4, to live a quiet life, to mind your business, not to fight with anyone. That also knocks down half of these things too. And then self-control, this knocks down fornication. This knocks down adultery. This knocks down idolatry. This knocks down envy and murders and drunkenness and revelries. Self-control is the root The lack of self-control is the root of a lot of the sins that keep us trapped in because we just can't seem to say no to the desires. And in the same way, going back to what Jesus says about the spirit being willing and the flesh being weak, in the same way that we deal with this battle between the flesh and the spirit, at the end of the day, this is one of the most important fruits. We need self-control to say no to the flesh and yes to the spirit of God. 
And what I want to say to you, if you're someone who's never accepted Jesus Christ, then there's really no, there's no out to the flesh. You have no escape from the flesh because you haven't invited in the spirit. And I want to really give you the opportunity. It's in the link in every single video. Pause this, open the description box. And if you feel led to rededicate or dedicate your life to God so you can receive a fresh inpouring of his Holy Spirit, that things that's going to help you from, from being bound by these sins and these fruits of the flesh for so long. If you want to finally be someone that puts to death your flesh, someone that gives a funeral to the flesh, you want to symbolically wear all black and put that flesh in a coffin, then receive Jesus Christ. It's in the description. It will take you no longer than a minute and a half and do it with your full heart and Jesus will meet you right where you are. Just receive him. And if you're someone that has already been saved, but you want to rededicate your life to God, just take a moment to say, Jesus, I rededicate my life to you and I'm saying no to my flesh. I'm putting my flesh in a coffin to never see it again. And here's the beautiful thing about Jesus. He knows that we're not going to be perfect. I'm not perfect. I sometimes let the flesh run rampant and I have to snap back into the spirit. And that's what happened to me today. Today, I was getting really irritated. I was getting really mad. And I felt myself getting some of the spirits of the flesh. And I said, Lord, I need the spirit of peace and I need the spirit of joy. Just like that. Lord, give me that fruit of the spirit because I need it. And I felt a peace that surpasses all understanding meeting me because he's so faithful. If he sees you trying, God will meet you. You only need to, but to take one te step and he'll take the 99 to get to the 100. He just wants to see a heart that is willing and obedient. It's not about perfection, but it's really about a posture that says, Lord, even though I know I won't be perfect, I'm still going to try my best to live for you. And I want to encourage us. I want us to be on fire for the Lord and to move out of this sarkikos, move out of our carnality and to walk into the divine purpose that God has for us. And I pray that this blessed you and encouraged you. And let's just live on fire for the Lord. Let me know what you think in the comments down below. Make sure to like the video and subscribe if you want to support the podcast. If you're an audio listener, leave a review um, and let me know what you think in the comment section. And also, if you feel led to support the ministry in any type of way, you can and also use the thing button here on YouTube. And yeah, I really appreciate you all. I love you all. Follow me on Instagram. And what else do I have? TikTok, um, my personal and my podcast page. And yeah, check the description box for the prayer of salvation, but also for important links to my Bibles and all the good stuff, the resources that I use. I love you all so much. And I will see you all in the next one. Have an amazing, wonderful week. God is with you. Bye, y'all.